Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Two Norries podcast. And we're all, again, we're on Zoom. Um, and it's myself and Timmy Long, of course, your host. Uh, this, week we have, this, this week we have a young man, Connor Harris from County Kildare. He's 21 since only September. He's a young man. He's the youngest we've had on. Um, so he's going to give his story um, and hopefully can help the younger generation because we realise myself and Timmy aren't spring chickens anymore. Um, even though we like to think mm. we are one of <laughs> So we just have a younger perspective. We just have a younger perspective. So Connor, take the floor. Yeah, maybe tell us, thanks very much for introducing me there. No, it has to maybe tell us about who you are, where you're from, and where you grew up. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah, thanks again, lads, for having me on. It's, you know, that was a long time ago. You know, good things come to all those who wait. Yeah. Uh, my name's Connor Harris. I'm 21. I was only 21 there in September. I'm from uh, County Kildare, a little small place called Rock Coffee. Uh, I'm a recovering addict, a very grateful recovering addict today. I'm 16 months in recovery and, you know, this recovery thing didn't come easy. You know, I was in addiction for two and a half years and I'll get into that story first. But, you know, just, you know, me growing up as a child, like, you know, as they say here, I was a pure black sheep. I come from a family of seven and I'm the only boy. So it was my mom, my dad, my four sisters. So, you know, my mom and dad separated when I was young and instantly when I was confined to me and four other girls you know my whole perspective on life changed it was like my dad was my father figure and it was like that was gone and that was when insecurities and all started kicking in like does he even love me do they even love me if my dad doesn't love me who does love me but he did and this is what the great thing is about recovery and I say this time and time again recovery has made me realize my mom and dad had issues that they couldn't do at the time and they had to do what was best for them. And I realised that now, you know, I realised that they had things going on in their life and they had to do whatever they had to do, you know. And I can see that from this point of view now. And I went on for 17, 18 years holding massive resentments against them. Like, oh, you know, they split up and I was left with no father and all. You know, now that I look at it, it's like, so what? You know, what happened, happened. And that's the great thing about recovery. I can take a step back and look and be like, you know, I love them for who they are and, you know, I'm sorry for whatever they went through, but, you know, I'm 21 now and they can go on in life realising, you know, they could only do what was best for themselves and help themselves and that meant not being together, you know, so be it. So, you know, it was like, obviously I was primary school and secondary school, you know, I'd done a leave and certain all that stuff. And, you know, I was a good kid. I always was a good kid and I will say that. I had a wild side to me, as I said. I was a bit wild, you know. I was always this loud and energetic person. And, like, primary school was grand. I went on in primary school and, you know, I was a massive football head. I loved football. Football was, like, to me, it was, like, my first addiction. All I wanted to do was play football, football, football. Because, Are we talking about know, got Gaelic, no... Gaelic football or soccer? Gaelic football, yeah. Can I guess no, your position? Gaelic football, yeah. Can I guess your position? Work away. Right half forward. Yeah, number twelve. Is it? Yeah, wing <laughs> forward. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to go. That there. was a f- <laughs> that was a fluke, James. Yeah, yeah. No, he we'll be, give you that. he we'll give you that. he right half forwards head them. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, but like you know, football would have been my first. You know, well, I wouldn't even. I don't know if I'd say addiction or not, but it was something that got me out of myself because, you know. Things weren't great at home when I was growing up after my dad left, you know. It was hard for me living in a house with four girls. And I just felt alone and I felt different and I just felt disconnected. And I felt like I couldn't talk to anybody because, you know, my dad wasn't there. I just felt like there's no, no one to talk to. Because a man living with four girls and, you know, I was second youngest. I was just like, you know... I tried to take on that man of the house role too young. Like, I need to stand up. I need to be the man of the house. But while I was doing all that, I wasn't looking at myself and I wasn't helping myself in any way. I was just trying to do everything for everyone else, you know? And it just, I got very disconnected from myself from that. And then if I did have any problems, I couldn't say anything to any of them because I couldn't show the weak side to me. Because mm-hmm. I couldn't show anybody that I was weak because I'm a man and I... I'm a man. I'm, it's 
for me, I thought was it wasn't okay not to be okay. I just had to put on a brave face and soldier on. That's the way I went through life for most of my life. You know, that's the way I went on. You know, after primary school, I like get into secondary school. And, you know, secondary school, I, I, in secondary school, lived, I wouldn't say a fake me, but I was this always person who was smiling and all every time, eight o'clock in the morning when I was coming in off the bus and people were like, why is he so happy all the time? But it was a mask. It was a complete mask to hide everything that was going on behind closed doors, you know? And that's why football did a great deal for me. I would train five, six days a week, you know, and this made me feel better about myself. This made me, you know, I was a good footballer. You know, I will say that I was a good footballer. I played with Kildare from the age of 14 up to just before minor. You know, football was my life. Football made done, done things for me that I couldn't do for myself, which was internally. But internally, it didn't last very long. You know, so then playing football, I got into the gym and boy, I thought I loved football. When I hit the gym, it was like this whole next level of love, you know, and I started getting into the bodybuilding and I was training six days a week. And, you know, I train in the evenings because I'd want to get out of the house and stuff like that because I couldn't be alone. And, you know, my little sister was born during all this and that added another girl to the house, you know, and which I love my sister from the bottom of my, bottom of my heart, you know. And her father lived there now, my mom and him got together. But, you know, I would have never seen I died to him, which didn't make things any better, you know. So I was just, I was just sort of lost, you know. I was just lost in myself. And that's what bodybuilding done for me. Like, I wouldn't say it was a, I wasn't a massive bodybuilder, but I trained and I trained and I trained. And I always wanted to stay in good shape. And, you know, I was always putting up inspirational things and all this and all this stuff up to try to help everyone else but still again I was not helping myself this whole time there was nothing done for me you know it was show them how great you are put on this mask be big be strong but if someone had came up to me in school and said Connor are you okay I probably would have burst out and cried I probably would have just broke down and be like you know I'm not okay nothing's okay absolutely nothing is okay yeah. you know yeah. this is how I feel and blah and I could I could give you a st- story I could write a book about how I felt back then but I couldn't because I thought it was not okay it's meant to be okay that's yeah. as me as a man how I felt and I don't know I feel like a lot of people relate to this as well when I'm in meetings and all like as us men there was always the stigma I feel that you know we never wanted to have a voice because we didn't want to show weakness and I didn't show weakness and I wanted to go on as this big hard man all the time that's the way I did go on with this mojo mm. and you know so in school anyway it was like TY and then fifth year basically this is where I started getting into drugs that's basically you know me growing up and stuff like that and this is all before the drugs that's you know basically how my life sort of went and I would have been into a lot into self-harm and stuff like that before mm-hmm. I even got into drugs you know because I felt like I could do nothing right and I felt like I was this heartless man and I remember nights I would be you know cutting myself and I remember one night especially you know I started cutting into my heart and I said to myself you know I want to cut into my heart and see if I actually have one because that's how heartless Mm -hmm. I feel and that was the position I was in without the drugs before they even started you know so that was the disconnection I had you know I was very disconnected growing up. Sounds like you were uh, in a really tough old spot Uh, Connor. I could relate to a lot of your, your stuff there particularly the self-harm and stuff I would have cut myself a lot as well as a young child you know um, and um, the the image of the, the man in the family home you know I would have grow, grew up as well um, in a home where where there was no male figure and I had to grow up fast but I also had to become the, the male figure in the household like you know, my mother would have been very unwell as well. And it was like I had to take on the husband role. And I was quite a young child at the time. And I can really relate to what you're saying. It's like listening to your story there, I could just see the spot where you stopped in your life, in your tracks, where everything just changed, you know. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's like to look at somebody like yourself you now, and um, just from our conversation, 
question. And here your amount of awareness that you have as a 21 year old. Yeah. It's it's unbelievable. Like you're yeah. uh, seriously like you fuck it. You know, it's unbelievable. You know, I just had to I had to come in there and just just um mention that there like yeah. as a and before you go on like there, like, before you go on there, there was something that you said there as well I like, could relate with. It was around you know, going into school with the, the, the happy face and all this. I remember going to school, I was the class clown. I always wanted to make people laugh. I was always getting thrown out of class and you know, acting the easy and nothing bothered me, but it, loads of things bothered me. It was just all of, it was just all a distraction and it, it was the same as I said, it was just all a mask. That's always covering up something else. And you made another good point as well. You were talking about, you know, doing the bodybuilding and putting the inspirational quotes up on social media, but deep down you weren't well enough yourself, you know. I think a lot of people do that in this day and age as well. They're too quick to go to social media to inspire other people and the motivation, like a couple of people, maybe that if I'm not working with them, but mentoring them or whatever, I just tell them to stay off Facebook. You know, because your worth and your recovery shouldn't be based on likes and interactions on social media. You know what I mean? Like, if you want to say something or inspire somebody, private mail them or ring them or text them, you know? Um, I think Facebook and Instagram can be um, false, kind of. A lot, a lot of it can be false and it might not serve you at all, you know what I mean? So get rid of that stuff. Get rid of the inspiration stuff from Facebook as they're working on yourself. And if you want to inspire people, go about it the right way, do you know what I mean? Um, but just on the self-harming thing as well, Kano. Before you started using drugs, you said you were self-harming. When you started using alcohol and drugs, did the self-harm stop or did you continue both? Yeah, both. Is... Yeah, I'll, I'll start, start I'll start exactly from what happened with the drug. So I remember, I won't talk about the first time I took alcohol now because I was never, you know, the first time I took alcohol, I wasn't really a heavy drinker, so it's not a massive part of my story. You know, I wasn't seeing it. That wasn't what brought me to my knees or anything like that. I never had this major love for it. The only time I drank a lot of alcohol is when I was taking a lot of cocaine. I, you know, I'm a raging cocaine addict, you know. So I remember the first time I took it, cocaine, it was, I was at a graduation. For the, so I was in fifth year six years of graduating, but because I played football and stuff like that, I would have been friends with the year above me, because I always would have, like, if I even when I was in second year, I would have been playing with the seniors, I would, would, would have always been playing a couple of years above me, you know, and I had a good relationship with, you know, a good group of people from the year above me, and one of my best friends was going to the graduation as well, so we went, and, you know, I remember I was, you know, I was locked drunk anyway, and I remember I seen him do it, and you know, I'll try it. As soon as I tried it, all bets are off, you know. And I remember it was just more and more and more. And that night I took it, all I wanted was more. It was the first night I took it and I was up in the, the graduation in Tala and I ended up getting kicked out. You know, and that's where it all began. That was the start to a miserable two and a half years. And don't get me wrong, I was like, you know, they say there was yokes and there was MD. Yeah, there was good enough. I had some good crack but you know if there was a million of them nights to put on top of one week of me in full fly addiction a million of nights of that would not make up for anything I went through in a week because towards the end of my addiction it was I can't like I can't even put into words how bad it was you know so after that I took it anyway you know I was still in school I was in fifth year it was just you know it ended up coming in a weekend thing you know and it was probably a Saturday night and stuff like that and as it progressed it would be like a Saturday night and then it'd be a Friday and a Saturday night then the Sunday and this was what I was going on into sixth year and and I would be sneaking out my house during the week to go to parties in the college that's in Manu the Manu University is right around the corner from me and I was just getting into partying and partying Excuse me. And uh, like 
it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then, you know, the odd weeks I'd be sneaking out to the university because I got to know the people in the college through some lads I know from my area. And we all know what college is like. College is, you know, for a lot of people, a party life. And if I'm going into the college of Manu, I'm not going in to go to the people who are studying. I'm going into the people who are partying. That's just plain and simple, and that's exactly what i done. But I was in, in sixth year anyway, and it was going on. And, you know, I never missed school or anything because of it, but towards the end of sixth year, I remember my leaving cert exam, and I say this and I don't say it proudly, going into my maths exam, I was sniffing out my head because before my maths exam, I went and met a fella to go get, you know, a big lump of drugs, and I ended up going in, sniffed out my head. And, you know, I started selling drugs when I was in sixth year. So I would have been, you know, would have been selling the coke and it just would have been, you know, to the couple of people I knew. And then I started getting comfortable with the money and then it was more. And then it was, you know, trying to run one area and providing to another area. And, you know, I was using on the weekends, but I was still, you know, making a small bit of money because I wasn't actually heavy into addiction then. But as time went on, you know, I suddenly realised, right, I'm not making any profit here. What's going on? And then the time I done, it was way, way do I owe money? And this was the progression. This is where it started. I finished school and I was off. I had a perfect start when I finished school. I was off to go into apprenticeship and cabinet making. He, the guy I was working with through sixth year on like my Christmas break and stuff like that. He was like, there's a start there if you want it. You know, and I didn't take it. I went off working with someone else and you know, the missing work days started coming in. So I went from a Friday, Saturday, Sunday to the Monday. Sure, why don't we bring in the Tuesday? And then this started happening, missing work. And my boss wondering why I wasn't coming in. And me making up a hundred excuses, you know. And I ended up getting let go from that job. I remember he had to let me go because I wasn't showing up. I was, I was no use, you know. Drugs, this is exactly when the drugs started taking over. The drugs had slowly become my life, you know, and then I ended up getting another job, another good apprenticeship, and I ended up blowing that as well within two weeks. You know, so I went from, at the end of sixth year, casually a Saturday night, to now a year into, or just a bit after finishing school, and I'm, you know, coming up for four or five days a week using cocaine and using it heavily, you know, needing it to get through my day. Because the relationship I had with bodybuilding suddenly became the relationship I have with drugs. I found a new love of my life because drugs did for me exactly this. I take this cocaine right now. I'm okay up here. If I don't have this, I'm not okay up here. So if I have my cocaine all day, every day, nothing's going to go on up here. My mind is going to feed me with absolute nonsense that everything's okay. But as soon as I come down... I don't want to be here anymore. Everything starts happening in my head and life just becomes a mess. So I went on anyway and I lost that apprenticeship. And that was, um, as far as I remember, in the summer. And I went on heavily using and then I was going on and it was five days a week and then six days a week and I was seven days a week. And it came up close. It was, that was in, I, I'm pretty sure that was the summer. And then I went on into just before my birthday that September and I remember I got my dog I have a dog now and I was like you know this will keep me clean you know this will keep me in at the weekends you know trying to fill that void but I know now no human power or nothing can keep me away from the drugs you know when I got the dog thinking that would keep me away from the drugs but the dog helped in me keeping it in the room so I could stay in the room more often to mind the drugs why I use more that's all the dog did for me because as time went on, I was afraid of the world. It just became me from going socially on the weekends to going to a load of partying to just full self-isolation. And that came up on October 2018 was when I had my first scare. So I was now using seven days a week. I was not leaving my room. I could not hold down a job. I would work maybe one day a week, two days a week. You know, what are you doing, Connor? I was 19. 19. I was nine, yeah, it was 2018 in September. I just turned 19. Yeah, it was 19. Mm. And I was the week before Halloween. And 
I got my first scare. I was up for three days. I hadn't slept. My best friend was in my house and I had to paint my room. I was like, oh, I don't feel well. I was like, oh, I was like oh, my heart, heart's killing me. And I knew something wasn't right and I went into my mom and as I was walking into my mom, I fell to the floor and I was like lying on the floor and I had my hands on my heart and I was like, mom, long story short, I said, um, I have a cocaine problem. I said, I feel like I'm having a mini heart attack and we need to bring an ambulance. I was like, ma'am, please, 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 I'm telling you the truth. I said, I know, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but can you please ring an ambulance? And I was lying on the floor anyway, and we were having this argument while I was on the floor, and she couldn't get over what was happening, and my neighbours came in, and, you know, my heart was going faster and faster, and, you know, as I was on the floor fighting for my life, I remember I said to my friend, just make sure you take the drugs out of my room, because I was thinking, if he takes the drugs out of my room, because there was a lot of drugs there I needed to get rid of, or I would have owed more money. But still, I was thinking ahead, if I survive, I can use when I come home. Mm. That's where my addiction had me. And I remember I was losing vision in my eyes and stuff like that. And I was holding my mom's hand and I was holding my best friend's hand. And I said, if I die today, I just want you to know I love you more than anything else in the world. And I am really, really sorry. And this, so I heard the sirens and the ambulance man came and I was put in the back of the ambulance and I was given, I think it's, the opposite to adrenaline I think you know it mm. slows your heart completely down so it's put into your veins and it just slows your whole system down and my heart was doing Jesus it was doing nearly 200 beats a minute or something like that when I hopped in to the ambulance and you know after after them couple of days when I got home I will I'll tell I'll go through what happened when I was at the hospital and stuff like that but I remember the lad said to me the guy said Connor do you know what the ambulance man said to you or just said to us and I was like what and he goes we had been a couple of, if they had been a couple of seconds later, you would have been dead. That's what my friends said to me, that they see me go off in an ambulance and had two medical men tell them that. And I was in hospital anyway, and you know, I remember waking up and I see my sister and mom crying at the end of the bed. And that was when I first got offered to go into treatment, but I still thought I had this under control. I said no, no, I don't need treatment. I said that's it, I am never doing this again not a hope he said that's it I'm, I'm gonna do this I'm, I'm gonna go get some counseling and stuff about what I need to deal with but I'm never gonna do that again a week later it was Halloween and I was off for the races this is how serious my addiction became you know and it's it's crazy like my life flashed before my eyes but still a week later I was out and I was off for the races and I describe it now this is the way I describe it. If I take a drink or a drug, I get a one-way ticket to self-destruction. It's a one-way ticket and I'm going all in and I'm not coming back because there is no way I can beat this addiction again. It's just, it's a one-way ticket to self-destruction if I ever, ever use again. What way was your relationship with your mother at this stage? There was a lot for her to digest there when you were having the heart attack, you know? And how was it at this time afterwards then? She was to be worried sick. Yeah, she was She was definitely worried sick and stuff like that. And, you know, I don't think she still really realised and I think she thought, she definitely thought that I was going to stop, you know? She definitely did. And, you know, I, I never really, the relationship with my mother was never the best growing up, but as time went on when I was using and I got closer to going into recovery, that's when I think she realised things that was going on with me and I think that's when our relationship got better. But, you know, after that happened, you know, our relationship did get better. But, as I said, no matter how good my relationship was with my mom or had it got with my sisters or my dad, that still wasn't going to stop me from using. And that's, you know, that is the power of this disease. And I don't say this stuff lightly. And people might people might say, oh, sure, you couldn't stop. There is no way I could have stopped on my own. And there's no way anyone can stop on their own. Because it's just not possible. Mm-hmm. Because if I could have stopped on my own, I would have done it as soon as I walked out of the hospital. I would have. Because I nearly died. No. So, I think I think a lot of us what you just described there, Connor, um, you know, the like the, being inside in a hospital bed uh, just after fucking ODing and fucking cocaine, right? And saying, I'm never again gonna do this. We've all done it, 
you know, because of the pain we're feeling at that moment. But as the few days go along, it gets easier and you kind of slip back into your old self a little bit. And before you know it, you say, do you know what? Wasn't that bad. I think I'll give it another go. We'll see what way it'll work out this time, you know. <laughs> but um, it's awesome. just this, you just said it, it's the strength of the drug. By cocaine was my addiction, my problem as well. I loved it. Loved it. <laughs> You know, I nearly lost everything because of it, because I was willing to, to, lo- to give my family up for cocaine, my two mm. kids and my wife, because um, because it, it, it done exactly what it done for you, it took you out of your head. You know, you had that little bit of freedom when, but towards the end, the cocaine made me completely fucking paranoid, completely paranoid. Um, I wasn't able to leave the house, couldn't answer the phone. I nearly lost my whole family, you know. Um, so I can really relate to what you're saying about the strength of it. You know, you were saying something there, James. Yes, as you know, what you reminded me of there, the two of you, uh, you know, years ago and you've been chased by the guards and you're hiding them behind the, <laughs> hiding them behind the ditch and you're like, God, get me out of this one, I swear. Yeah, I'm never yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. you get away and then the following week you've been chased around the same ditch. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I swear I won't do it again, guys. Or when you're after getting a white heat, you know, a ghostly after smoking yeah. a bit of hash or a bit of weed, yeah. and you're up in the bed and you're called up into the book, please, God, if, if you just stop this time, I'll never get used. Like, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Oh, just lasts for a few yeah. minutes, right? It's way more powerful than we think. Yeah. Uh, like, I thought I, I thought I had power on my own, but. You know, as my counselor said in treatment, when it comes to power over this disease, we are as weak as piss in the wind. That's that's there's no sugarcoating it. That's exactly what it is. Like, yeah, I agree. You know, with you. you're pissing in the wind if you try to do this on your own will. Yeah. You need people. Yeah. You need you need other people. You need social interaction. You need yeah, to be yeah. doing people with other people that you relate to and where you can share the same yeah. stories and energy. You know. That's the key to this. It's the key in my in my eyes. The key to recovery is having people like that around you, and and also dealing with the stuff that you would have drank or drugged on. There's there's a saying in recovery: um, nobody can do it for you, but you can't do it alone. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. true. It's true for everybody. You know, you you can't do it your way, and you definitely need a support network around you. So when you're trying to change your whole life, you ha- you, you can't just say, right, I, one more and I'm going to change everything. No, you need support around you. You need to be around people that have been there and that can help you and support you. Like-minded people. Yeah, yeah. And, and mentors and people that you can trust and you can confide in because you have to offload some of the stuff. Why are we using too with somebody, a sponsor or a therapist or whatever, you know? Sorry for interrupting yeah. you there, Connor. Can't no, no, continue it's there, nice. Man. It's nice. It's nice to have the little chat in between. The you know, yeah. you know, it's nice. I don't want it to just be all me because as an addict, you know, it's tempting. But you're better. speaking very well, anyway. Unbelievably, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I came out of hospital anyway, and put a twenty grand, twenty grand debt on my head. I added it all up, and there was twenty grand on my head. Credit union loans, the whole lot. Stopped using for, you know, I think the longest I stopped using for in recovery was two weeks, but then I only stopped using for a week. When I came out of hospital, I had to get loans upon loans to pay bills and stuff. And, you know, right on after that time, through Christmas, through the new year and all, I was just, I was just, I was just at the races and, like, there was no one bringing me home. You could have got a fork, a lorry load of lads in there to all carry me home and I just still wouldn't have went because I was just so caught up in self. And... There was just no getting out of it, you know. I, I thought I didn't need help. I really, I really thought I could do it. Even though, as you said, James, you were sitting at home paranoid seven days a week. That was me. I still thought tomorrow it would be different. And this is how crazy it was. After that happened with my heart, I I said to the lad, I was like, "Well, since that happened to me, I don't really get paranoid off the coke anymore." He said, "I think that, I think that, with my heart is after helping you." That's what I said. They were like, is this fella all right? That's yeah. that's how it, that's what how it made me think. And yeah. I'd be lying at home after having my heart, and, you know, I'd be lying in the bed and I'd be sniffing, and you know, I'd feel my heart going, and I'd grab my heart and I'd hold it, and I'd lie on my side and I'd open the window, I'd breathe, I'd breathe, 
and it'll settle down. Boom, 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 boom. And I do the same thing again. You know, it was it was madness. And anyway, I went off into the new year and anyway, and stuff like that. And, you know, something that I will remember for the rest of my life happened on Mother's Day, you know, 2019. And, you know, this was my breaking point. This was, you know, when you say you have a rock bottom and, you know, I say this is a rock bottom, but I believe, this is what I firmly believe, people should never think that was my rock bottom. Never think like that. Because you need to know that there is lower places than that rock bottom you've hit if you do go back out there again. Don't act like that was your lowest point because that addiction is waiting for you and that will bring you down further if you let, you know. So Mother's Day, anyway, 2019, I'd been out on a session and out on a bender and whatever, and I remember we were all down at the Liffey. And, like, if I, if I close my eyes right now, I could play the tape and watch what happened over and over again because this is how much this did with me. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. We're all after leaving the house we're in and we're all down with the Liffey and, you know, I had obviously a load of drugs on me and stuff like that. I hadn't came home in two days. My mom didn't really want me home because, you know... Who really, as much as my mom loved me and she kept giving me all these chances, like, you know, sometimes for other people, there's enough is enough. But she never gave up on me the whole time. It's just them two days, you know, I wasn't really wanted in the house, but she never gave up on me. She never kicked me out of the house. She done, She fought to and nail to help me in my recovery or in my addiction. And anyway, the lad left early that morning. I remember it was about 10 o'clock and they're like, all right, my friend was like, come on, you come back to my house. And I was like, Nah, man, sorry. He said, oh, you know, it's Mother's Day. You go and enjoy your time with your mother. I said, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to get a bit of sleep. And then I'm going to, you know, go on home and surprise my mother because I want to be fresh. And she's like, no, no, you're coming. Like, Honestly, I said, I'm fine. Don't I look fine? And they're like, oh, right, right, fair enough. And, you know, they left. And as soon as they left, I broke down in tears. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. And I could hear the echo of me cry because it was around the lift. And it was just all trees around it. I was screaming up to the heavens, I was, why is this happening to me? And I was walking back and forth and I was, you know, grabbing onto trees and just squeezing things for comfort. And I'd never actually felt so, so alone in my life. It was by far the worst day in my life. You know, sometimes when I talk about it, I get a bit emotional because it was, it was honestly the worst. I never cried so much in my life. I never felt so alone in my life. And it was the time that I, of all my whole life, I just did not want to be there. And I walked over to the water and I was just sitting there. And I was like, why? I said, why do I need to be here anymore? And I was screaming. I said, if there's anyone out there, somebody please help me. And, you know, nothing was happening for me. I was looking around, just hoping someone would come save me. And, you know, I thought, you know, fuck this. And I got off my jumper and I walked back and I was screaming and shouting. And as I was walking back and forth from the Liffey, I was taking off a piece of clothing until I was down into my boxers. And, you know, I sat there feet at the water and it's like you know maybe everyone will be better off without me and just in that second I was about to take my own life I get grabbed in a chokehold by the back of the neck and that was when something came over me that Jesus Christ I actually want to live because that was my closest encounter to ever dying I know that was when I was 100% sure I was about to take my own life but something up there saved me you know I got bit someone put someone grabbed me in the chokehold and put me back and I was just screaming, crying, and it was my friend and I grabbed them and I just hugged them and I 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 was crying and I was crying and I was crying and he was like, What the fuck are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? Sorry for my language, but I was like, uh, I was like I couldn't get any words out because I was so happy that he came and saved me, but you know, at the same time I was disappointed because I didn't want to be here. And I was just crying and crying and crying and crying in his arms. And I could see the shock in his face. And, you know, he goes, I remember I was crying his arms. He goes, do you know the only reason I came back here was to give, was to give you that bottle, bottle of water that you asked for two hours ago? He goes, I was just about to go home. But I remember that you wanted a bottle of water and I brought it back for you. What happens if I had never came back with that bottle of water? You would be dead. You know, and I remember I went back and I was, I was walking back to the car and I could barely walk because I was just... I was broke, and I mean, like, I was absolutely shattered to smithereens. It was my rock bottom. It was the lowest point of my life. It was the worst time of my life. It was 
it was just something I know when I am still 50, 60 years old that I will not forget because that is something that will live with me forever. And, you know, that person that day saved my life and there is no, there's no two ways about it. He saved my life and I thanked him when I got out of treatment. He is the reason I'm probably still here today because I'm fully sure that if he had enough game, I would have drowned myself in that war because plus I cannot swim. Do you know when, but, uh, um, can I ask you about what, what, what was going through your head at that time that led you to want to go into the water? I know I know there's drinking drugs involved, yeah. but was there a feeling of a feeling of isolation and exclusion from the family or Just abandonment or feeling like feeling like uselessness and feeling I felt like nothing. I felt like I'd no use to anyone in this world. I felt like I had done everyone wrong, but and this is one thing. I tried so hard to do everything I could to get out of this addiction. And my family, you know, my family didn't realise and they thought, you know, I was being selfish and stuff, but really they didn't realise, they thought I didn't love them, but I loved them more than anything else in the world, but I just could not show it. And that's what killed me. Like, I have this beautiful family at home that want the world for me, but I can't show them I love them because I'm so broken and I'm so wrapped up in addiction. And I felt like, you know, they'd be better off without me and I was no use to the world. And, you know, if I could feel like this, what was the point of living? And that's exactly how I felt that day. And that was the reason, you know, I tried to take my life and I was, you know, it was, it was scary. It was, man, it was just, it was crazy. I don't even know how to describe it, but it was just the worst time in my life, definitely. Was that the the motivation or the catalyst to find yourself in recovery eventually? Yeah, that was. So I ended up using again after that for two months, and I ended up ended up in the hospital again with signs of a minor stroke. But that's when, you know, after that happened, when I tried to take my life own life, I had tried to take my life in between that as well. I'd wrote suicide letters. I'd, you know, got. Up I uh, edited off Snapchat and wrote on the cover of my phone saying, I'm sorry for this, but if you find me dead, I love you or my mom. I put my phone under my pillow and tried to sniff myself to death in my own bed. That's all the things I was doing after I took my own life because I wanted to die, I wanted to die, but something wouldn't let me, you know? And I wasn't afraid of, I wasn't afraid of dying. I just was afraid of living because I couldn't live anymore, you know? And I was in, I ended up getting in touch with a, uh, place called Halo Youth Project it's in Mason you know I started getting counselled in there and I was using while I was going to counsel now but you know I kept showing up no matter what I kept showing up and the people in there fought to and nail for me to get into treatment and that's when I started ringing the treatment centre it was Brewery in Limerick and you know they fought to and nail for me to get into treatment and I had to ring and ring and ring and I ended up getting into treatment on July 17th 2019 and five days I think I started using five days or I stopped using three or four or five days before I went in I stayed at my best friend's house a couple of days before I went in because I couldn't stay at home because I know I would have used and my best friend kept a close eye on me and made sure I did not use and that's the type of friends I had in my life and you know that's how great they were and since that time I have not used since you know, I done a five month rehab program. It made me figure out a lot about myself because when I went there, I felt safe. It was tough. I was I was sober. I was free from all my and substances, but still, I was crying and I had a lot, a lot of shit to deal with. A lot. I had a lot of stuff. You know, there was layers to be tore back in me, but I did and I tore them back. I done everything I could to put myself in the best possible position to leave that treatment centre knowing that I left no stone unturned and it's exactly what i done but going into treatment I felt like the world was against me you know and I was very defensive and I was you know I was starting arguments and stuff like that but as I went on you know and I want people to realise this I realised that all people out here want to do is help you that's all and I realised that when I went to treatment nobody was against me you know everyone just wanted to help me and I, I started letting people in you know, when I started talking and I left it anywhere I went through treatment, I won't really go through treatment, you know, I'll just say that treatment centre is a brilliant treatment centre and I highly recommend it to anyone if they're thinking of going to treatment. Treatment centre is absolutely great. 
it done wonders for me, brought me back in my structure, my routine. I was working in the treatment centre. It was for five months, you know. I only got to see my mum four times while I was there. Got one phone call a week. But that was good for me because I had to get down to the nitty gritty stuff. You know, I had to face myself. And what I did was face myself. You know, when I left that, it's nearly, it's coming up to actually December 6th. So next Sunday, I think it is, I'm a year out of treatment. Congratulations, you know? well done. And it has been the best year of my life. And I don't say that lightly. Like, I get emotional sometimes when I think about it. It actually makes me cry how happy I am since I left treatment because I put in so much work. You know, I've done, I've moved out of home. I don't live at home anymore. I live with my girlfriend. I met an amazing woman when I came out of treatment. She's seen me at my worst. You know, she's been there when I was using. She's seen me coming down. She's seen me crying. She's seen me at my worst. And, you know, now we're living together and we have an absolutely fantastic relationship. And I have a great relationship with mother today. And anything that happened in the past is just wiped away. You know, it's over and done with. It's left. Who cares? You know, I love her for who she is. I realised that she had problems. I realised my father had problems. And that's their stuff. I love them for who they are. My mother and my father, all my sisters, and everyone in my circle has been absolutely amazing to this point in my life, you know? And it's I'm 16 months in recovery, and I've had no close, I've had no close encounters with using, you know, because I do what I have to do. Like, I hear this stuff in meetings and stuff like that, and, you know, it's not that it annoys me, but, like, some people say, like, to rely on God for everything and I do believe like yeah you know I do have a higher power and stuff like that but you need you need to do stuff for yourself you know you need to get your ass up out of bed mm. for me it's four o'clock in the morning to go to work and I need to get my ass out my book out and I need to do my reading and I need to do my meditation and I need to attend my meetings because nobody else is going to do this for me and that's what I've done since I came out of treatment, the first thing I did when I got out of treatment was I seen my family and then I went to a meeting straight away. Mm. You know, and my life has been amazing since. They were told me, you know, stay on over Christmas. You know, Christmas is a bad time, you know, and, you know, it's a lot of relapse and happens. If I wanted to relapse, I would have never been in the treatment centre. I would have left. So I mm. came out and I had the best Christmas ever with my little sister. My little sister, as a lot of people know, is my world. She's my absolute world. I don't live at home, but I go home to see her every single weekend because she is, you know, she is just my absolute pride and joy. And I live, I now live with my girlfriend. I have, I done my first job interview since I've been in recovery and I got the job. You know, you, I, work, well done you. I work with, I work with Aldi, you know, and I work in the Aldi warehouse and, you know, I'm, I get up, I do work, work six days a week and, you know, I'm just pushing hard to, you know, fix up financially all the messes I made when I was in addiction. But I stressed for so, so long when I came out treatment over it. Now I'm just realizing, just putting in the work and doing what I need to do. Keep doing what I'm doing and there's nothing to worry about. Exactly. So I can walk down, I can walk down the road now and I don't have to look over my shoulder. You know, I don't have to worry about anything anymore. I've got a good girlfriend, I've got a good family. I live, as I said, by myself. I'm getting my first car next week. I want to be insured for the first time. All these little things are happening because I'm putting in the work, you know? Yeah. And it's just, it's it's amazing, you know? I came into recovery at, at 19 years old and I always thought I was too young to come into recovery. And I will say this, and I mean this wholeheartedly, if anyone thinks that they're too young to come into recovery, you are fooling yourself. Because I thought, Life is all about the money, the drugs, the drug dealing, going out and sleeping with girls, all different girls every weekend. You know, none of that only made me happy in that moment in time, you know, temporarily. Permanently now, I am happy because I know I have a job. I know where I'm going to sleep tonight. I know that I don't have to wake up in the morning and I don't have to see if there's anything left. That is what recovery to me is all about. No matter what age you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what sex, what race, what gender, recovery here is here for absolutely everybody. Anyone who wants it, it's right here. And there's such amazing people. And not not a lot of people know him in recovery. Like, you know, and I don't go around, you know, blasting out there and stuff like that. But 
if I am in the position to tell someone, I do say, you know, I don't, I don't hide it either, you know, and like for me, I like to, I don't, I don't meet a lot of people my age in recovery, you know, and which is sort of the sad thing I always find when I go into the rooms. Well, at the start of my recovery, I always found when I went into the rooms, I would have been one of the youngest there, but, you know, I'd like to see the younger gener- generation, you know, maybe if they do relate to this and if they do see, you know, maybe I am in that position. You know, I would get in contact with anybody, anybody. I would talk to the wall at the wall detail. If there's somebody out there. And how can how can people contact you, Connor? My, the only, I don't do Snapchat, I don't do Facebook, I don't do that. The only one I do is Instagram. I do Instagram because, you know, I like looking at my stuff for the gym and stuff like that, whatever, but. I've been yeah. Instagram hip. So we'll post we'll we'll post your link in the description here so you can contact you yeah. through there. I I get a lot of people, I get a lot of mothers especially contacting me saying that their young fella or young girl um is going down the wrong road or going down the wrong path and taking drugs and violence and crime and all these things and can you do anything for them? But you can't actually change somebody, you know, unless they want to yeah. change. But I hope that if they if they watch this they'll see you you know, 19, 20, 21, to have the maturity to realise that drugs and drink is just a fool's game and there's no real happiness in that. And the happiness is actually in life away from all that, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely isn't. Because one thing I actually left out, I've done a TV show with RT, you know, when I came out of treatment, I went... That makes two of us. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying. Cause I was saying to the people, I was like, because when I asked you about the podcast, when, you know, my friend seen Reggie's post, I was like, does this name sound familiar to you? And she was like, one of the producers, and she was like, yeah, I was like, this fella was on RT as well. And I was like, yeah, I was like, I'm going to, you know, do a podcast with him. And, you know, she, you know, she said to me, she was like, oh, he was the guy, the real inspirational guy. And I was like, yeah, I was like, and, you know, we're both inspirational guys. We're going to do a talk together and all. You know, it was cool. Yeah. So I done a TV <laughs> TV show with RTE, and it's it's called it's going to be called Davy's Toughest Team, and it comes out at half nine on the third of January, twenty twenty one, and it will be over the course of the four Sundays in January. And there's there's I'll just I won't go I won't spoil it I won't do any spoilers. That I asked I said to them could I just say a bit about it? and he said yeah. And there's basically seven seven of us young lads and we all come from different backgrounds and stuff like that. I'm the only person in recovery, which is really good, you know, so I talk a lot about basically the story I've talked on here, you know, because obviously, hopefully like a couple of hundred thousand people see it on RTE, you know, so what I wanted to do and when I done the show with RTE, it was like, why should it stop here? You know, why should my story stop here? Mm. Now I've seen the chance to do this with G and it's like, no matter how big or small the platform is, take the chance to do whatever you can to help anyone who needs help. And that's exactly what I'm doing. You know, I want to get across my story as much as I can. I'm preparing a presentation to try to get into schools and stuff like that. Your man who's done the TV show is, you know, helping me out. And, Excellent. You know, I just don't want um, it to end. I want to keep it going. I want to do whatever I can for the people what, who need it most. What's, what's your plans for the future, Connor? Plans for the future is, so... I finish up my contract with Aldi in next May, but I'm hoping they offer me a long-term contract and I will take that and see the year 2021 out so I can be financially stable. And then mm. I want to go on into a cabinet making apprentice. I was looking into, you know, I wanted to go back and do studies and stuff like that, but, you know, I, I would like to go back in and, you know, get a nice trade under my belt and, you know, with my girlfriend then when she's finished her college, I'd like to go off and do some traveling and stuff like that and see the world because you know I have the opportunity to do that now you know I can I can do and this is what I want people to know you can do when you're in recovery you can do whatever you want in life bar drinking drugs so there's two things out of two billion things you can do so which is better you know it's 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 simple you know so I want to I want to travel and you know getting I've my 12 lessons done you know that was my goal for 2021 I haven't wrote down I looked at my notes the other day and I wrote down back in June that my goal for 2021 was to finish my 12 driving lessons to get a car and pass my driving test and it's not 2021 yet and I've my 12 lessons done and I have a car coming next week so I'm smashing Thanks. my goals you know I, I know you've 
I know you've appeared on the Two Norwich podcast, so you're after the pinnacle. Yes, exactly. It's all exactly, downhill from exactly. here, Connor. <laughs> no, it's, all, it's, all, it's, all, it's all been uphill in life. And it will be. It's are, going to get better and better. It's only starting for you. Yeah, exactly. And you know, So there are my plans, you know, get a good trade under my belt and, you yeah. know, support my missus mm-hmm. while she finishes, while she goes through college. And, you know, after that, you know, we can look to go travel and stuff like that and then you know what in the future settle down do you have kids or, yeah. you know, is, um, is, is, is the education route not something you'd be, have any interest in, in Connor or, or do you just prefer to work with your hands I was looking into I wanted to go back into psychotherapy and stuff like that but I don't know that is my honest answer I, I want to the part of me wants to go into psychotherapy but part of me you know I have a good group of friends and we're all in trades and I would like to get into a trade and maybe, you know, work alongside them, set up a company and, you know, that's the type of stuff. I know they're not in recovery, but they're my best friends. They've stuck through me, yeah. with me through everything. And it's, oh, it's, your it's, it's so beautiful because, right, I was obviously told not to treat me, you can't go near your old friends and all this. I go out to my friends every weekend because I live with my girlfriend. I used to go out, I hang out with them, with no problem. About seven, eight, nine o'clock, I come home, I do my meeting, they go off and do what they do. You know, and it's just, it's perfect. There's, there's no more I can describe it. That's how I imagined it when I was in treatment. I was like, I hope it can work out like this, and it's exactly how it's working out. You know, so I'd like to be alongside the group of friends I have for, you know, forever because they're good yeah. people. And, yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, I yeah, they do whatever they want, but I don't give a shit. I don't care. Do you know what, Connor? And um, you said something there, and I thought it was very important. Um, it's just relating to um, what you want to do going to schools. I think your story has great potential to help a lot of young people uh, in recovery. You know. Because you're 20, what are you, 21 now? 21, yeah. You know, Jesus Christ, that's amazing. Like, uh, And have 16 months behind you and have the awareness you have now. Like, a lot of people will listen to your story because they can see themselves in you, which you being young. Because I know myself when I was when I was in treatment as a young young person as well, um, I, I had the same shit going on in my head. I'm too young to give up a drink. I'll give it up in 10 years. Little did I know when I went back on it, the 10 years that I went back on the drinking drugs nearly fucking just destroyed me like you spoke about earlier. It nearly killed me, you know? So um, I think follow that path most definitely um, uh, and find a job where they will allow you to go to schools when you need to um, and talk about your story because that is a massive, massive influential story that will help an awful lot of young people trust me in that path um, and follow it and it sounds to me like uh, it may be a, a most definite purpose in your life to do it yeah. you know? I definitely so, feel like it is and it's just sometimes I do get, I think about it and I just get nervous and stuff like that and, you know I'm not perfect and they still do have insecurities and stuff like that but things like this and things like the TV show are helping me so you know I've I, me and my girlfriend do you know work on my presentation a bit and we worked on it a bit the other night and it's just a matter of polishing my presentation up sending it off to the guy seeing what he thinks getting more feedback and just getting it as well and ready as I can and you know I'm not going to stress myself over it yet but Definitely 2021, I want and I know I will be in my first school doing a talk and I will make sure that. Brilliant. And we'll be doing the same in Cork. So keep fighting yeah. the fight and flying the flag. And yeah. best luck with everything going forward, Connor. You speak yeah, really well. You um, you're very articulate. You're a handsome young man. You've your whole life ahead of you. And best of luck with everything. And stay in touch, please. Yes, definitely. Thanks very much, James. Thanks, Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Connor, boy. Cheers, See you buddy. Later.